Okay, we're in the uh, series uh, Grace in the Book of Romans. This is lesson number five in that series. The title of this lesson, The Response of Grace, part two. And we'll be covering uh, Romans chapter three, beginning in verse 21. Now, in our last lesson, Paul summarized man's spiritual situation before God in the following way. He said that man, by rejecting God's original offer of grace, finds himself condemned and helpless to change. In other words, mankind knows what God wants and what God wants is a sinful, uh, sinless life, but is unable to give this to God even if he wants to or tries with all of his might. So a terrible situation for mankind. Uh, Paul also makes the argument that all humanity is in this spiritual condition, guilty before God and subject to condemnation. And so this dilemma ushers in God's second offer of grace, and that is to save man from this dilemma through Jesus Christ. And so Paul explains the second offer of grace. Remember we said that the first offer of grace was the actual creation itself uh, by God and uh, man at the head of creation, man's intimate relationship with God. All of that together is God's initial offer uh, of grace. And so a second offer of grace is made to mankind and Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 3 verse 21 to 25. So last week I explained the key words in this particular passage. This week we're going to examine the passage itself. So we begin in chapter 3 uh, verse uh, 21 and that says, But now apart from the law the righteousness of God has been manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So now in, in, in previous verses, Paul explains the different ways that God's righteousness or His rightness has been revealed in the past. And God's righteousness or rightness has been revealed well by, by the creation, uh, by the creation of man with a, with a conscience and with willpower, the man having the ability to choose. Uh, the revelation of God's word and the law that God has given, all of these things explain how good and righteous God is and consequently how sinful man uh, has become. So we continue uh, in verse 21. Uh, uh, Paul now says that God's righteousness is manifested in yet another way which is not dependent on the law but a manifestation that was uh, pointed to or signaled by the law. So it's not dependent on the law but it was pointed to by the law. In other words, the law, which was necessary to reveal and to condemn sin and thus demonstrate how righteous God is in comparison to man, this law is not necessary in the same way to usher in this next manifestation of God's righteousness, although it did point to the coming of it. Verse 22a, he says, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Uh, even there, the, the, that word can also be replaced with the word yes or yea. The righteousness of God that is manifested when a sinful man becomes righteous because of faith or because of belief in Christ. So basically he's saying God, you know, he's demonstrated his righteousness through the creation, through this offer of grace and so on and so forth. Now he's, he's making a demonstration of his righteousness in the way that he saves man through Christ. So God's righteousness is on display when an unrighteous sinner is transformed into a righteous saint through the power of faith without reference to or help from works of the law or without human effort. So the fact that this transformation is possible, the fact that this transformation is offered to everyone, this shows how righteous God really is. So we continue to read. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So Paul reaches back to former conclusions about man's true condition, right? Man's true condition that he's already established in chapter one is that man is guilty and man is helpless, man is lost. 
you know, falling short of glory means that man is unworthy of God's praise. And why is that? Well, because he says, everyone's guilty of sin and no one is searching for him. And all efforts to reach God are actually based on works of law and strategies. In other words, human efforts to please and appease God and all of these types of strategies are doomed to failure because they lack two important things. They lacked purity and timelessness. Those are the two elements that indicate spirituality and divinity. So what God's justice requires, uh, perfection, purity, eternity, man can never supply, well, because he's doomed to die and he's impure. So it's not within man to offer to God what is necessary in exchange for salvation. He continues to write, verse 24 and five, he says, being justified as a gift by His grace through redemption, which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith. So Paul um, explains why this transformation and why this recreation was accomplished and how it was accomplished. First of all, man is declared justified. In other words, he's declared innocent and therefore righteous. This declaration is a gift from God. This status, which is undeserved and unattainable for man, is offered to him by God as a gift. And, and, and God offers this to him because of his compassionate, loving attitude, or as we have been saying, because of his grace. This is the why. This is why God offers this to man in this way. All right? Now, Paul also explains the how. This gift is made possible because Jesus Christ satisfies the justice of God by becoming the appeasement or the propitiation, another word for appeasement, to satisfy the demands of God's justice and condemnation of the law because of men's sins. And, and God did this publicly by the historical nature of Jesus' death on the cross. You know, God could have done this you know, in, a, in a secret way, in the heavens, in the spirit, all by himself. But he didn't, he did it in an historical way. Meaning we can pinpoint the day and the time, even the hour when Jesus was actually sacrificed on the cross. And he did it historically so that it would be witnessed historically by men. So if you were a Jew, then you would see that Paul is saying that God uses Jesus not only as the, you know, the mercy seat to cover the law, to satisfy, to fulfill the law, but also uses Jesus' blood to atone for the sins of all men. So as a Jew, you understand this language and what it means. Now, if you're a modern man, you would understand that God pays off man's moral debt by himself, providing payment in Jesus, because we are bankrupt morally and cannot pay our own moral debt that we owe to God. And so we summarize this idea by saying that God appeases himself by allowing his son to suffer and die instead of us. Now, why does this satisfy him? Because he loves us so much, he doesn't want to lose us eternally. So what does he do? He sacrifices Jesus, who because of his sinlessness cannot be claimed by death and thus spares those of us, which actually all of us, who can be claimed by death because we are sinners. So this gift, Paul says, is received on the basis of faith. It cannot be earned. So to see this, we need to put a, a comma after the word grace in verse 24 and after the word blood in verse 25. So that man is transformed or recreated from being a helpless, guilty, condemned sinner to a righteous saint as a gift from God received on the basis of faith, this shows how righteous God is. That's, that's the point that, um, that uh, uh, Paul is trying to make. Uh, fallen man cannot um, 
appease to God, you know, cannot appease God or move Him with any quality or quantity of human effort. However, man can believe. It is within man's emotional, intellectual, spiritual capacity, and it is a universal common denominator. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman or black or white or yellow or you, you know, very rich, very poor, uh, different social circumstances. Everyone can believe. It's within the human capacity to believe. And so God makes this the common denominator among, among human beings uh, for salvation. And so uh, the, the proper response to God's free offer of forgiveness is to believe, okay? Because it is the only thing that all human beings can do in a satisfying way before God. So that, that, that God is, has worked out this plan and accomplished it through Christ and made it available to all men through the gospel and that it is possible for all men to respond, this reveals how righteous God truly is. That's the argument that Paul is making. You know, he's saying at the beginning, the creation, the law given to mankind, man's relation, initial relationship with God, all that, 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 that showed how God was righteous, his initial expression of grace. Now he says, aside from the law, you know, works of the law, things like that. There's another way that God is demonstrating how righteous He is, and that is the way that He saves man, the way that He's expressed this second expression of grace, uh, that salvation for mankind will be based on faith and not works and so on and so forth. That's another way that God expresses His righteousness. And this is God's response to man's rejection of his initial offer of grace, to show how righteous he is, and he does this by offering a second offer of grace, and that is salvation by means of faith. All right, so in verse 25 and 26, Paul summarizes the whole affair by declaring that this plan, this method to save man, this second offer of grace does two things. So let's read. He says, this was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So first of all, God demonstrates his true righteousness. He shows how wonderful he is by offering not just one offer of grace, but two offers of grace. The second offer results in the passing over of sins previously committed for those who believe. That's what that means. Some people think it means, you know, oh, God's passing over all the sins of everybody. No, remember, we're talking about how God saves people. So his second offer of grace is how he passes over sins committed by those who will be saved by faith in Jesus Christ. And then the second thing he does is he uh, demonstrates that, that God is totally responsible for our salvation. He is just and requires payment for sins and he upholds justice. And he is also the justifier. In other words, he offers mercy in that he works out the way that his justice is going to be satisfied. So the net result is that the law is fulfilled and the law is served. Man is saved and God is shown to be righteous through all of it. A marvelous demonstration of his power and wisdom, his uh, mercy and his justice. So after presenting this case for the Christian religion, Paul goes on to answer questions that would naturally arise from this argument. One such question would be, well, what about the law? You know, in other words, doesn't a person accomplish innocence by obeying the law? I mean, you know, the Jews thought that they were declared innocent by uh, by, by virtue of the fact that they had obeyed the law of Moses. 
know, the best example of this is the, you know, the rich young ruler. You know, he, he, uh, he believed that he had obeyed the law and yet was somehow dissatisfied with himself. And in calling him to disregard, you know, Jesus says to him, you know, go and, and give your riches to, to the poor and come follow me. You know? So in calling him to discard his riches, Jesus was bringing this young ruler deeper into the true meaning of the law. Hmm. And the meaning of the law was to love God with all of your heart. And so he was demonstrating you know, to the rich young ruler what that meant in his case. And of course the rich young ruler readily saw that he couldn't do it. And he walked away, right? We read about this in Mark chapter 10 verse 17. Even today the Jews believe that they can uh, uh, obey the law and thus acquire righteousness based on compliance. So Paul responds to this argument, to this question in verses 27 to 31. You know that they were mistaken about this point. He reiterates that a person cannot achieve innocence or righteousness through a system of compliance with rules, in other words with law. Righteousness can only be achieved through the system of faith which he has outlined previously. From now on when he talks about faith and saved by faith he is including the whole idea of God's grace and offer of forgiveness based on believing in the Savior. So let's, uh, let's read verse 27. It says, where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No, but by a law of faith. So what has eliminated the element of pride in man concerning his salvation, Paul asks? The fact that he cannot earn it. He must receive it based on faith. This system eliminates the possibility of anyone taking credit for his salvation. No one can do or offer to God anything more than anyone else. All can believe and the same thing is required of everyone. You know, when, when, when I was saved, it required my faith in Jesus Christ expressed in repentance and baptism. When you are saved, it required exactly the same thing, whether you're a man or a woman, rich, poor, you know, everyone is asked the same thing in response to God. And there is God's justice and mercy is demonstrated as well as His wisdom. In verse 28 he says, for we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. So he summarizes and confirms his position. He also emphasizes that compliance to rules merits nothing insofar as gaining innocence. Because compliance to rules never gives you back the purity that sin causes you to lose. This purity is given to you by faith once you have it. If you can have a relationship with God, you know, this, this is what you get. You know, the essence of salvation is not something that you get, it's something you experience. And that experience of salvation, that you know, recreation, that uh, um, you know, reintegration into God's, into a relationship with God, that's an experience. And that comes by faith, Paul explains. Okay? And it's given, not earned. In verse 29, 30 he says, or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since indeed God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith is one. Is one. And so the system of salvation by faith is universal in that both Jews and Gentiles are to be saved in exactly the same way by exactly, uh, I mean, exactly the same way by the same God. All right, so another question arises and the question is, do we abolish law or you know, the, the, the mosaic law or the principle of law? Do we abolish law if we accept salvation by faith? and God's system to recreate man? That's another natural question. Well, what about the rules, right? 
Verse 31, he says, do we then nullify the law through faith? You know, he asked that question. May it never be, he says. On the contrary, we establish the law. So the true nature and purpose of the law is fully explained and established when we understand the principle of salvation on the basis of faith. And Paul will explain this a little further on in chapter five and then in chapter seven, we'll go into it there. But basically, the purpose of the law is to reveal sin and to pronounce judgment on it. And there's a sequence to this, right? First of all, the law reveals how and to what extent that we fall short of God's glory. Now the Mosaic law did this in an historical context. We could read the law and, and, and we, we, we saw the requirements of the law because it was written out. And we also witnessed the response of the Jews to the law because we have the history. We have their history from Abraham all the way to Jesus. We see the history of these people and how they did. You know, never mind the Ten Commandments, <clears throat> excuse me, never mind the Ten Commandments, just the first commandment not to worship any other gods. I mean, how many times did they fall into idolatry over and over and over again, right? So we have a historical record of their compliance to law and also uh, the success and failure they had as far as their compliance to law. So the law did its job with the Jews as a test case, demonstrated how do people respond to law. The principle of law did this in a philosophical context. You know, uh, 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 people who were not exposed to the Mosaic law, <clears throat> nevertheless, did they do what they ought to do? We see the history of the rest of the world. How did they do with what, you know, the, the natural law, the principle of law? So the law, whether it be the revealed law or the natural law, it reveals failure, it reveals sinfulness. Secondly, the law pronounces judgment. Once sin is revealed, the law reveals to the sinner the consequences of sin, and that is death and eternal suffering, uh, articulated in the revealed law, and also you know, articulated but through our conscience in the, in the uh, principle of law, man naturally has the dread of death. Why? Because you know, we're afraid to die, naturally. We don't know what's on the other side. We, we feel there'll be a judgment of some kind. Thirdly, man's response. At this, point, at this point, man has several options in his reaction to, law, to the law's accusation and condemnation. Uh, one response may be to ignore it. Whether you're a Jew or Gentile, just ignore the law. I, I live for myself. I make my own law. I make my own rules. Well, then those people are subject to judgment, of course. Other people, they dive into sin despite the knowledge and warning of the law. They know the law. They understand. They may even believe it but they ignore it, they, they dive into sin anyways. And of course, this leads to that cycle of falling that Paul talks about earlier. You know, theological fall, philosophical fall, moral fall. Another response would be uh, to try to obey the law and thus avoid judgment and punishment. In other words, compliance for salvation. If someone tries to do this, several things may occur. They may become hypocrites, thinking they have actually succeeded in obeying the law. You know, uh, we know those people, you know, they're, they're comfortable in the pew and they're also comfortable in the world. You know, the Pharisees were a good example of this. Uh, they thought they obeyed everything, they were, you know, pff, they were in compliance and yet they were as worldly as, as, as non-believers. They themselves did not do what the law said that they ought to do. Um, or, uh, they may become slaves to the law or perfectionists, always trying to live up to its demands. You know, those who are active. You ever see people who are active in the church but they have no joy about it? These are usually against any move towards compassion and grace because these two mean freedom and they don't, they don't want anyone to be free while they're slaving away at trying to you know, comply. Uh, the older brother in the, in the story of the prodigal son, he's one of these persons. You know, Haven't I done everything you asked? Haven't I always obeyed? But he was never happy, never satisfied. 
then some people become discouraged uh, and fall into religious depression when faced by the unending demands of the law. In the modern day, these are the ones that go from church to church looking for the right answer, the magic solution, or the perfect situation, and usually end up quitting and mad at the church instead. Judas, he was one of these guys. Disappointed, you know, God, Jesus didn't live up to his idea, you know, so he went and looked for something else. And then there are those who cry out for help. You know, they see the demands of the law and they recognize they can't live up to that. So they cry out for help. They realize their helplessness before the demands and judgment of the law. These people say to God in all honesty, I'm not able to do what you want. I want to do what you want, but I realize that I'm not able. I need your mercy. I need your grace or else, or else I'm lost. So this is the person uh, uh, who, who, who understands the purpose of the law. And this person who is at this point will finally meet Jesus and understand what salvation by faith really means. And you know what? You, salvation by faith usually requires the death of our pride. You know, there's a certain amount of brokenness that is required. Um, for us to really come into a salvation based on our faith. Uh, sometimes it comes before we actually enter the waters of baptism. Sometimes we enter the waters of baptism purely uh, out of obedience and that's fine. I mean, that's the reason I was baptized. I, I realized that that's what the Bible, that's what God uh, demanded of me and I, I wanted to please Him. I didn't you know, fully grasp all of the things we're talking about today, obviously. It's only later on that I fully began to understand you know, how wonderful His grace was, how merciful He was to me. Sometimes it takes a little time, but eventually we all get there. Eventually, hopefully, if we continue on with Christ, if we continue on with our faith, we eventually get to that point where we realize, man, I, I can't be saved. I can't be pleasing to God simply through compliance. Obviously, I make an attempt to obey God and I get better at it as I grow in Christ. But I, but I always recognize that the thing that He wants from me is faithfulness. He wants me to be faithful, uh, not just in the times that I'm succeeding at being compliant to His will. He wants me to be faithful even when I see myself failing. Am I still faithful? Even when I'm discouraged, am I still faithful? Even when he seems far away and I feel spiritually dry and I'm asking myself, is this really true? Is this, you know, am I still faithful? Someone wrote to me recently talking about a certain you know, lack of enthusiasm that they were having. This is someone not in the church here, someone that, you know, um, online, someone that looks at the, the Bible talk material wrote to me and they, they, they had lost a certain enthusiasm. And, and this person said, you know, we're, I, I'm still kind of you know, doing my best to, to follow through, to do what I know is right, but I've just lost the enthusiasm. And I think that's a common thing. I feel like I'm just going through the motions. And I reminded him that you know, doing the right thing and attempting to, to be pleasing to God and to do what, what you believe He wants you to do, even when you don't feel it, even when you know, there isn't that enthusiasm. That's called perseverance. That's called patience. And I reminded him that even if he didn't see God, God always saw him. He was always in God's view. And I reminded him that he is not the only person that experienced this type of thing. In the Bible, we see Job, I mean, you know, where are you, God? Why'd you do this to me, God? You know? And Elijah, I'm the only one left. You know? And Moses, how many, how many times of you know, loneliness did he feel? And Jesus, 40 days in the desert. It says only after the, te the temptations was he comforted. But for 40 days, right, fought the wild beasts in the desert. So it's not surprising that that happens to us as well. So those of us who have been saved because of our faith, not works, 
we continue to be saved because of our faith. Because despite what the world around me is saying, despite how I feel, despite my, my lack of spiritual enthusiasm at the moment, I continue to believe because belief is not an emotional thing. Belief is, is up here, right? Belief is something that I decide upon. I decide that something is true. And once I decide that something is true, I order my life to fit that truth, whether I feel it or not. Unfortunately, in our society today, so many things are based on our feelings, how we feel. But Christianity is, is not like that. And so the person who's at this point, as I said, will finally meet Jesus in an intimate way that they haven't before, and they will grow in their understanding of what it really means to be saved by faith. And so getting back to our, our book in Romans and Paul's letter here, in this way, Paul explains that the law brings you to the threshold of grace, but it is faith in Christ that brings you into the state of grace. All right, well next time we're going to do a, well Paul is going to give us a case study of salvation based on faith. And he's going to you know, go back to Abraham as the prime example of someone who is saved by faith. And we'll take a look at that uh, next time we get together. Okay, thank you for your attention. We'll move on to lesson uh, number six next time.